Okay, this is 12.5, the motor principle. So this is using some ideas of magnetism that we've learned and applying them to actually make a motor, to make something that moves based on electricity, which, again, that's normal for us, that's an everyday occurrence for us, but it was a big deal. So um, Faraday took off where um, others had left it behind and said, okay, we've got current running through a wire and we can make that uh, wire move when that current is running through some magnetic field. So Faraday managed to do something pretty impressive. He made a wire move continuously continuously in a circle by placing it near a mag magnet and running current through it. So that's kind of a big deal because before we could make a wire move but it would just sort of happen and it wouldn't be a continuous thing that we could actually use in a constructive way to make something like a motor. Now um, what he was able to do is get this wire to move in a circle. There's a little picture of his, ex of ex his experiment right here. And you can see the way it works is that he has his battery. We've got our current running through the wire and through this wire into the um, into the, it's, it's sort of hard to see what's happening here. Okay, actually, sorry, the, the red wire goes this way. We have the current coming up through here. Current comes down through here. You see we have a wire hanging down and it's going into here. And then that wire is sitting in a pool of mercury, which is liquid metal, which means that it's going to conduct the electricity back through into this black wire and back towards the battery but it's still going to let the wire move freely in a circle around this central magnet. You see that he's got a magnet placed in the middle of that uh, mercury. So that's a pretty cool idea, and it proved that we can get some continuous motion out of this uh, phenomenon. Okay, and so we'll just look at a couple other ideas here. Um, we've got a picture of two magnets creating a magnetic field. So we've got a magnetic field going from north to south, of course, north to south. And we have a wire in between there, you can see that the wire then has this, this uh, field going in a circle like this, going that direction and that direction. So you can see on the top, the fields match. On the bottom, the fields are opposite. And we said if the two fields are going in the same direction, if the field lines are in the same direction, they repel. And opposite directions attract. So we can actually use that to make the wire move in a predictable direction. So you can see that we get a net result downward because of that uh, force. Okay, so all of that goes on to say that we have the motor principle. And the motor principle tells us that a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field experiences a force perpendicular to both the magnetic field the magnetic field and the electric current. That's our motor principle. And it is a very useful principle. It leads us to our final right-hand rule, right-hand rule number three, 
This is the last one. And here it is, right below. It's the right-hand rule for a moving charge in a magnetic field. So if we have current running through a magnetic field, if you point your right thumb in the direction of the velocity of the charge, V, and your straight fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, then your palm will point in the direction of the resulting magnetic force. So your fingers are in the direction of the current, or sorry, your thumb is then in the direction of the current, fingers are in the direction of the field, and towards your palm, towards the open side of your hand, is the force. So there's a picture over here, you can see that we have finger is in the direction of the current, I'm sorry, thumb is in the direction of the current, fingers are pointing in the direction of the field, and it means that we would get, in this case, a force going upwards. It's towards our palm, towards the open side of our hand. Okay, and in here, notice it says things like B and FM. You don't need to worry about that. This is taken from a grade 12 textbook where they use the same principle, but you don't need to know that B is the symbol for a magnetic field. But that is the case. Okay, so here we have a few problems using this principle. We want to draw the magnetic field lines of both the mag magnet and the conductor, then determine the direction of the force on the conductor. So here we have north to south on the magnet, north to south. So we're going to have fields like this. Our wire is coming out of the page, so we stick our thumb in the direction of the, the current, wrap our fingers. My fingers are curling around in this direction that direction. So you see that they match on the left, they're opposite on the right, they get pushed away when they match, they get attracted when, they, um, when they're opposite, so the force is going to be in this direction. Okay, we'll do the same thing here. We have north to south, north to south. Now the um, current is going into the page, so my finger sticks towards the page, my fingers curl in this direction, in this direction. So you can see now on the right, they're the same direction. On the left, they're opposite directions. means I get a net force going inwards. Okay. And one more situation here. So we've got north to south here. North to south here. North to south. North to south. And our electrical current is running downwards on this wire. So I point my thumb downwards, my fingers curl going in this sort of a direction. Okay, so my fingers curl in that direction, so then I need to see where my... Um, uh, so I need to... Sorry, the last two, we weren't really using the, the motor principle, but this last one, we need to use our motor principle. <coughs> So I point my thumb in the direction of the electrical current. My fingers point in the direction of the magnetic field. Well, you can see here that we have a... Um, one second. I'm sorry, I, I kind of um, led us down the wrong path with this one. We do have these field lines that I've drawn here on the magnets. But the most important field lines are the ones that are going from the north of this guy to the south of this guy, and I'm drawing them in green now. So we have a field that's really going to be a lot stronger going in this direction. So now we have a current pointing downwards, a magnetic field pointing to the right, so my thumb goes down, fingers go to the right, and my palm is facing towards the page. So now I get a force into the page. There we go. Okay. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing. I'm sorry that uh, the, the blue fields on the magnets there are not too important on this last question. All right, if we pop on to the next page here, we have the analog meter. And this is going to be important on the next lesson, so I do want you to follow along with this idea. So the analog meter, well, um, you've used these in class. You've used ammeters and voltmeters, those were analog meters. You connected them to your circuit and the arm moved based on the current that was running through them. The very first analog meter was called the galvanometer. And the galvanometer was an interesting um, invention. 
it used the motor principle, and the way it worked, it was an analog scale And actually, before I say anything else, I'll say what analog means. Analog means that it is physically moving. Which means that it is not digital. Usually analog and digital are, the, are used in contrasting ways. So analog meters, these are physically moving um, without any sort of digital components. Okay, so this is an analog meter, or an analog scale, that can measure current. By how much it twists as a result of the magnetic field. As a result of a magnetic field. Okay, so we have a few pictures below here of, of what this galvanometer looks like. So you can see we have our, um, our magnet and our, um, our meter. So we have electricity running from our positive terminal through this coil. Okay, and that's sort of just a, a spring here. This spring is going to um, let it move to left and right. And then it moves from that spring into this coil of wires. You can see that it then coils around like this, around the object, in sort of a circle, and then the electricity comes back out the other end into the negative terminal. So we have a better picture of what's going on to the right here, where we can see one wire going in. Um, so one wire going into the page on the right here and coming out on the other side of the page. So you can see that that wire going in creates a magnetic field in a circle like this. And the wire coming out of the page creates a field in a circle like this. If we have an overall magnetic field from these magnets around it going from the left to the right, like this, you can see that that's um, the field that we're producing. Well, you can see that these wires are then going to experience a force. We have this sort of net force, and I'm simplifying things here. You're, you're, the picture does a better job of really showing all the details. But we have this net magnetic force from left to right. So if we use our motor principle again, we can um, put our thumb, let's say for the right one here, our thumb is going into the page for the current. So I'm looking at this guy right here and at right now. So my thumb is going into the page with the current. My fingers are going to the right with the magnetic field. My palm is facing downwards. So this right one experiences a force downwards. And on the left, we have the wire coming out of the page, the current coming out. So my thumb points away from the page. My fingers are still pointing to the right. So now my palm is facing upwards. It experiences a force upwards. So you can see that these wires end up getting twisted. The one on the left gets pulled down. The one on the right gets pulled up. They're all connected together. So that means that the whole thing ends up rotating in this direction. And that's what we get. So that's how this scale, you can see this, this arm, this needle, moves in this direction. And we're able to get the reading. So when you were using your ammeters and voltmeters, that's exactly how these were working. And that's the next point here, is ammeters and voltmeters are actually just made out of galvanometers. So an ammeter is a galvanometer with a resistor in parallel. And a voltmeter is a galvanometer with a resistor in series. We have pictures of those down below. So you can see that um, 
this first one here is our ammeter. And so we would connect this in series with our circuit. And you can see then that the current gets two options. One of the, the current can either go down or through the galvanometer. And the idea is that the resistor there is a very low resistance so that the current mostly wants to go down in this direction. And it mostly gets redirected away from the galvanometer. And that's because the galvanometer is very sensitive. We don't want to overload it with too much um, charge, so we just only send a little bit of it through the galvanometer. And for the picture on the right here, this is our voltmeter. So we connect this in series to our circuit, so it might look something like this. We would have our, our light bulb here. And we would connect that in parallel here. So you can see, again, our current is coming along in this direction. And it can either go through the light bulb or through the galvanometer up this way. And again, we have a high resistance here so that not much current is going to go through this top guy, again, protecting the galvanometer, so that most of the current is still going through our circuit. And that's also good because we don't want to take away all that current from our light bulb when we're measuring it. We just want the galvanometer to just get a tiny glimpse of what's going on. OK, and so that is our lesson. That's how motors work. That's how these um, ammeters and voltmeters and galvanometers work. Take a look at the homework problems, and I'll see you in the next lesson.